Joshua chapter 15. We're getting into some chapters here in our study of Joshua that deal with the specifics of where the boundary lines were for these tribal divisions. The, the major battles are over. There's only skirmishes left. There are some seated, there's some pockets of Canaanites that still need to be uh, removed. But essentially, a lot of these final chapters of the book deal with just the borderlines. Uh, defining where these things are. So we're going to skip over a lot of this because it probably doesn't mean anything to you. It's like giving you directions in a town that you've never been to. You know, take a, take a turn, turn right down at the tree stump and then go five miles and then turn at the rock. And it's like you've never been there and it doesn't really mean anything to you. So, um, but we're going to look at some of these things anyway. Um, I'll go ahead and put up a map that we did. I think it was our last study. Chapter 15 deals with the allotment that is given to the tribe of Judah. And in verse 1, it actually begins by saying, the allotment for the tribe of the people of Judah according to their clans. And it's going to, first of all, define where the tribe of Judah, and you can see that's a huge area there in the south, where the tribe of Judah was going to be and then at the end of the chapter it's going to talk about where they were by clan so if you really want to get personal and find out how to send a letter to some of these folks I'm kidding of course it's like why they wrote all this stuff down where the individual clans resided it's it's you know they, they kept really good records not that it's all that necessarily important for you and I to know but what's interesting about chapter 15 is that almost like an Oreo cookie sandwiched in between these, this information about the, the tribal boundaries and the boundaries of where the clans were, there's this interesting little section that begins all the way down in verse 13. So skip down there, if you would. Verse 13. And it talks, and it makes some comments here about Caleb's family. Remember Caleb? We talked about him last time, the man who... Uh, was now in his 80s when he began to start taking the land that he himself was going to live in with his family. And he, remember he said, I'm as strong today as I was when Moses first sent me out to spy the land. He and Joshua were the only spies who came back and said, we can do this. And all the rest of them said, we can't. Joshua and Caleb were kept alive for the remainder of the 38 years of wandering in the wilderness. Now they're both in the land and Caleb is just as strong as he ever was. He's gone in and he's taken the land. Not only did he take the land, we talked about this last time. Caleb not only took the land, he took the land that they were most afraid about going into. Remember remember the one thing the people, the spies came back and said that freaked everybody out? Remember? They said there's, there's giants, right? So Caleb gets done going through all the major battle scenes and then he goes, all right, I want my portion. I want the land because Moses said to me that there would be some special stuff coming my way and I want it and I want to take it. And you know what I want? I want those giants. I want those giants that everybody was so afraid of and I'm going to take that land in the power of God. And he did. Caleb's a great guy. I just, I love reading about Caleb. He inspires me. But it says in verse 13, According to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, he gave to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, a portion among the people of Judah, Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron. So he basically got that area of Hebron. Arba was the father of Anak. And Caleb drove out from there the three sons of Anak. Remember, they were all afraid of the Anakim? They were giants, they said. And, and it names them there, the descendants of Anak. And it says in verse 15, And he went up from there against the inhabitants of Debir, now, the name of Debir formerly was kiriath Saphir, And Caleb said, whoever strikes kiriath Saphir and captures it, to him will I give my daughter. Yeah. Aksa. I guess that's what he called her. And he says, I'll give her as the wife of the man who goes up and, and, and takes the land. And we are told, in verse 17, that Othniel, the son of Kenaz, who was a brother of of Caleb, so Othniel is Caleb's nephew, went up, captured it, and he gave him, true to his word, his daughter, and said, here you go, bud. Uh, she is your wife. So Caleb's nephew, 
and I think this is interesting, was inspired by his uncle to go in, take the inhabitants of Debir, and so he not only got the land, he got the girl. It's the way you want every story to end, right? Plus, Othniel, when we get into the book of Judges here in a few weeks, well, after the first of the year, we're going to find out Othniel is the very first of the judges. Did you know that? He is going to be called upon to rescue the nation of Israel when they begin to sink into disobedience and that sort of thing. This man stays faithful his whole life long. And um, so, interesting, I'll, I'll talk more about this, this, this influence of Caleb in just a little bit. But then his daughter makes an appearance in these next verses, uh, beginning in verse 18. It says, when she, and it's talking now about Aksha, uh, who came, uh, excuse me, came to him, she urged him, speaking of her husband, Othniel, to ask her father for a field. I'm not sure, it, you know, so she kind of went and did it. And she got off her donkey and Caleb said to her, what do you want? And she said to him, give me a blessing. And she said to him, since you have given me the land of the Negev, give me also springs of water. And so he did. He gave her, it says here, the upper springs and the lower springs. What do we see in the life of Caleb? First of all, the man Caleb was a man who was daring and full of faith. What do we see about his nephew? He's daring and full of faith. What do we see about Caleb's daughter? She's daring and full of faith. She's just, you know, she has faith in God. She has faith in, in her dad. And, and we see that, you know, she's given, obviously, Othniel, he went and took the land, and so he got the land, he got the girl, and, and, and his daughter comes to him and says, you know, hey, you've given us the land. Now we want to be able to water it. We want to keep it, you know, watered and fertile. And, his, and her dad says, great, you've got it. She had faith to ask her dad for what she needed. She went and did it. He granted her request. What we see here, and I want you to see this, you guys. I want you to see that Caleb, as the senior member, of this family becomes this extraordinary example of faith that I think is important uh, for us to see here. And not only to see, but to be. To be that example of faith. Those of you who are younger, this is something you have to look forward to. Those of us who, you know, are, you know, past the mid mark, you know, this is something that we aspire to, to be that example, to be that influence, to be that life of faith to our children that is something they can respond to, you know? Something that our kids can look at and say, wow, you inspire me to go in and hold fast to the promises of God. You inspire me. Your faith inspires me. I want to be like you. I want to have faith like you. And, you know, to have a family that's just daring, you know, and that's willing to, to step up and say, you know, this is what I need. This is what we're going to do. We're going to take the land. We're going we're to fight, you know, the inhabitants. We're going to clear it. You guys remember, don't you, the clearing the land? Putting the... the, the the axe to the root, as it were, is kind of a picture of the battles that we face as we walk out the promises of God, right? You guys remember that that's, that's what clearing the land is. It's a, it's a symbolic picture for you and I of what it means to walk with Jesus victoriously over the flesh, over the world, over Satan, and over all the things that get thrown into our path. And they are many, right? I mean, we're, we're constantly battling something. We're either, we're either going into a battle or coming out of one. Some people have said to me, you know, I just, I just wish life would kind of slow down, and man, do I understand that. But it probably isn't going to. <laughs> you know? I mean, graciously, God gives us rest from our enemies from time to time. And that's wonderful. Those seasons of rest are delightful. If you're in a season of rest right now, God bless you. Enjoy it. But just know this. There's another battle around the corner because we're continuing to press in. 
We're continuing to lay hold of the promises of God. We're continuing to move forward. Well, I hope we are anyway. And when you move forward, you will encounter opposition. And it will be either the flesh, or it will be Satan, or it will be the world, or it will be all three. And you and I must address those things by faith, right? We must walk by faith. We must battle by faith. We must trust the Lord that He can clear the land. He can go before us as we have that attitude of Caleb and just say, even if it's a giant, I want it. I want the land. I want what God has given me. I want to take it. So it's a, it's a faith walk from beginning, beginning to end. Uh, and I love, the, I, I, I love the family of Caleb. I really do. Now, in the latter part of this chapter, uh, verses 20 and following, they, they, they just get into the tribal divisions. And this is where it gets into some of the specific, or not tribal, excuse me, the, the clan, the, the divisions of the cl- uh, li- uh, land by clan. And then if you'll skip all the way down to verse 63, the chapter ends this way. Last verse of the chapter. But the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and at least until David came along, the people of Judah could not drive out. So we're told that the Jebusites dwell with the people of Judah at Jerusalem to this day, or at least to the time of that writing. The Jebusites were still there. This is one of the first comments as the tribal allotments are given that tells you and I they didn't have 100% success. They didn't clear the land completely. Some of the Canaanites stayed in the land. Some of them stayed in their cities. And of course, you and I, we both know, because we've read the Bible before, this is going to come back to bite the Israelites hard. You know, I mean, there's going to be It's going to be really difficult. And, you know, remember what I said? Going in and clearing the land is getting rid of the world and and just resisting Satan and and getting rid of sin in our lives. And when we don't get rid of those things, when we we put up with them or we can't move them, it's always going to come back to bite us, right? If If there's areas of sin in our lives that we just aren't willing to deal with or we've neglected to deal with them for some reason or another, um you know, it's, it's going to be a problem, and we'll actually see more of this, and, and we'll talk, we'll have an opportunity to talk more about it as we go. Joshua chapter 16 is very, very, very short. In fact, it goes along with chapter 17, and it covers essentially the uh, tribal and clan allotments for the sons of Joseph. You'll remember that they are Ephraim and Manasseh. Notice where they are on the map, on the left side, you see Ephraim just above Judah, small area actually. And then you've got Manasseh right to the north of that. But then you notice that there's another section of Manasseh over on the other side of the Jordan and on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. That is the other half tribe of Manasseh that took a land allotment on the east side of the Jordan River. Um, although that land really wasn't given them originally by God. That wasn't part of the promised land. Uh, Manasseh, the half-tribe of Manasseh, the tribe of Gad and the tribe of Reuben stayed on the other side of the Jordan. uh, And that's where they took their land. Um, So that's what they're going to kind of talk about. Let me just tell you, though, um, you remember that these are the sons of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, and Joseph got a double portion. He had two sons, And his sons were adopted by his father, Israel, Jacob, so that Ephraim and Manasseh became known as the sons of Israel, even though they are actually the sons of Joseph. And the reason is because Joseph received a double portion by having both of his sons get an allotment. Now, what you may not know is that this central area of Canaan is the most fertile, the most lush area of the land and so they not only got a double portion they got really kind of the best and that's that was you know god's that was god's will 
Um, it begins in verse 1. We're not going to read all this because, again, it goes into specifics of where those boundary lines lie. But it says, The allotment of the people of Joseph went from the Jordan by Jericho, east of the waters of Jericho, into the wilderness, going up from Jericho into the hill country to Bethel. And then it goes on from there. In verse 5, it begins uh, with the boundaries of um, Ephraim, specifically. It says in verse 5, the territory of the people of Ephraim by their clans was as follows. And then it gives you those specifically. Skip down to the, very, the end of this very short chapter, verse 10. And it says, however, and this is kind of a familiar verse. They did not drive out the Canaanites who live in Gezer. So... The Canaanites have lived in the midst of Ephraim to this day, but have been made to do forced labor. So we have yet another familiar end to a chapter that says they went into the land, they took the land, but not completely. Chapter 17. It says in verse 1, Then allotment was made to the people of Manasseh, for he was the firstborn of Joseph, to Machir, the firstborn of Manasseh, actually he was the only son of Manasseh, and the father of Gilead were allotted Gilead and Bashan because he was a man of war. Now we're talking here about uh, the allotment to Manasseh on the east side. Okay, So that's for you on the right side of the map, up at the very top, upper right. That's what he's talking about right there. Verse 2 says, And allotments were made, to the rest of the people of Manasseh, by their clans, it names them. And then it gives us some interesting information in verse 3. Look with me in verse 3. It says, Now Zeliophahad, the son of Hefer, the son of Gilead, the son of Machir, son of Manasseh, had no sons, but only daughters. So, kind of like Hector. Except... I think he's done a better job of naming the girls. Um, this guy, his, the name of his daughters were Mela, Noah. I didn't realize Noah, you know, until I read this the very first time, that that was a unisex name. Didn't know that. Here's it is. It's a female, also named Noah. Isn't that something? Um, Hogla. Don't say Hogla. That's not a good thing to call a woman. It's Hogla, Milka, and Terza. All right, so girls, all girls. They approached Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the leaders, and they said, The Lord commanded Moses to give us an inheritance uh, along with our brothers. So according to the mouth of the Lord, he gave them an inheritance among the brothers of their father. You know, this is really pretty cool. It, it, you might just read through this and not think much of it, but these women had the faith to step forward and ask for their portion, even though they weren't men, and they even got the rules changed on their behalf. And they basically went before, you know, the leaders and said, why should we lose the allotment of our clan just because our dad didn't have any boys, you know? Why should he be penalized? And, uh, you know, now later on, these women, some people are going to kind of step up and say, now, wait a minute. What if they marry outside their clan or outside their tribe? Then the land that was allotted to them will go to another Tribe, that's not right. So they did marry within their, their, their tribe and, in their, and I think even in their clan. But, uh, but for right now, you can see that this is a pretty cool thing that's going on here. And it says in verse 5, Thus there fell to Manasseh ten portions beside the land of Gilead and Bashan, which is on the other side of the Jordan, because the daughters of Manasseh received an inheritance along with his sons. And the land of Gilead was allotted to the rest of the people of Manasseh. Verse 7 goes on to say the territory of Manasseh reached from, and then it begins to give the specifics of the boundary lines, and it goes on and on and on. Skip down to verse 12. Now, this gets interesting, guys. I want to I want, I want to focus on this a little bit tonight. It says in verse 12, yet the people of Manasseh could not take possession of those cities, but the Canaanites persisted in dwelling in that land. Now, when the people of Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but did not utterly drive them out. That's an important 
note. Then verse 14 tells us that the people of Joseph, meaning Manasseh and Ephraim, spoke to Joshua saying, Why have you given me but one lot and one portion as an inheritance? Although I am numerous, a numerous people, since all along the Lord has blessed me. This is an interesting statement. What the people of Manasseh and Ephraim are saying is, we are the blessed of the Lord, and we are many. So why have we gotten such a small inheritance? Okay, let's look at the map again. That looks like a pretty big inheritance to me. Now, what you can't tell by looking at the map is that a lot of it is forest land. And it would, in order to settle it, it would require, obviously, going in and clearing it. So, but they're, they're kind of saying, in essence, it's not really livable, you know. So we need more land. We need a larger allotment uh, for our family because we're numerous and we're blessed. The Lord has blessed us. We're the blessed of the Lord, right? And Joshua said to them, look at verse 15. This is really interesting. He says, if you are a numerous people, go up by yourselves to the forest and there clear ground for yourselves in the land of the Perizzites and the Rephaim, since the hill country of Ephraim, is too narrow for you. And and now they have a different kind of excuse. They say the people of Joseph said, well, the hill country isn't enough for us. And then they give the real reason. Look what they go on to say. Yet... All the Canaanites who dwell in the land have chariots of iron. Both those in Beth Sheen and its villages and those in the valley of Jezreel. Stop there for just a moment if you would please. This is an important remark that is made by these people. And it's important that you and I see this because this is going to, we're going to apply this to our own lives. The response of these people to Joshua when he says, Hey, if you're a numerous people, you guys are so numerous, you ought to have plenty of help. Remember, you know, it's like, hey, many hands make light work, right? So the, it's forest land. You know, you got a lot of people. Go up and clear it. Go take it. If you're a lot of people, then you got a lot of help. Go do it. Go take care of it. They say, well, it's not, still not going to be enough. You know, we're, we're the blessed of the Lord. We need more land. But then they go on and they tell what's really going on. There's an underlying issue here, and it's in the last part of verse 16 where they say the Canaanites are living in those areas. We can't get them out of there because they've got iron chariots. Do you know the fact is they didn't? Well, the chariots were made out of wood. They just had iron kind of reinforcements. So, but yet they're calling, you know, they notice how they refer to it. They don't, they don't say that. They don't say they've got pretty strong chariots. They go, they have iron chariots. Whenever you focus on the problem, whenever you focus on the thing that you think you can't defeat, whenever you focus on the thing that makes your enemy seem the strongest, it always becomes worse in your eyes, right? Whenever you focus on the thing that is keeping you from being obedient to the Lord, from walking out and taking the promise of God, when you focus on it and make it the focus of your life, it becomes worse than it really is. So these wooden chariots with iron reinforcements are now iron chariots. We can't go in there. We can't clear these people. And that is what's really going on. You see, they believed. They believed like those spies that went into the land so many years before that their lowly foot soldiers, even though they were many, were no match for these Canaanites and their chariots. You see what had happened over this period of time? What happened to that, 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 that attitude of faith that God gave to the Israelites to go into the land and to believe that it was he who would clear the land if they would just walk in obedience? What happened to that? What happened to believing that God was their strength, their power, their ability? What happened? Now, what are they doing? They're looking at what's in front of them, right here. They're just looking right here, focused on the issue. And and what happens when you focus here? What happens when you focus on the problem? It gets bigger. It gets stronger. It gets insurmountable, right? What happens when you put your focus on God? 
You have the attitude like Caleb. Well, we, we can do this. Why? Because God's all powerful. Yeah, but they got iron chariots. Big deal. You, what is that to God? What is an iron chariot to God? It's nothing, right? Well, how do you get that kind of an attitude? By focusing on the iron chariots? No, by focusing on the God who is greater in, in, in so many ways than anything man can devise and, and anything that stands in your way. Guys, let's face it. Let's call it what it is. The underlying issue here for these people is unbelief. What is it that stops you and I from going in and taking the land? And you know, it's funny, isn't it? We've got all these excuses why we can't do this. We need more land. You know, you know what they're saying? We need land that's unoccupied. This land's occupied. First, there's people there in the, in the valley, and up in the hills, it's all full of trees. We can't build our houses and cities there. It's, a, it's forest land. We need land. We need, we need just easy we, they, they want it to be an easy sort of a thing, but what's really going on is unbelief. So Joshua goes on here in verse 17, and he says to the house of Joseph, to Ephraim and Manasseh, he says, you are a numerous people and have great power. You shall not have one allotment only, but the hill country shall be yours. For though it is a forest, you shall clear it and possess it to its farthest borders. For you shall drive out the Canaanites, though they have chariots of iron, and though they are strong. Boy, you come back, and you hear, hear Joshua, he's an old man now. He's an old man, he's probably around 110. But listen to what he says to these people. He still has this kind of faith. They come at him, and all they've got is complaints. We can't do it. The people are too strong. We need an easier sphere of, of influence, you know. We, this needs to be, you, know, you need to make this easier on us here. But that's, that's code for we don't have faith to take the land. Joshua says, you can do it. You're strong. You're numerous. The Lord is with you. Go take the land. Clear the forest. Drive out the inhabitants of the land. The Lord will go before you. You can do it. How often? I thought to myself, is this situation repeated in the lives of uh, the children of God today? You know, where we're just not satisfied with what God has given us, or at least that's what we say. And there, there's not enough, you know, there's not enough scope for our gifts or 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 there's not enough of what we want to do to serve the Lord, and we want a larger uh, sphere of service. We want a larger you know, stage upon which we can serve the Lord and so forth. But the fact of the matter is, in the very area that God has given us, the enemy is still entrenched. And we just want to get away from it. And we want to go somewhere else, you know? Have you ever noticed in the New Testament when Paul is giving qualifications for elders, he says an elder should have his family in order. His children should be obedient to him, right? And, and, and they shouldn't bring up any kind of a reason for blame. So, you know, why was he saying that? Was he saying that because that was... You know, we, we call those qualifications, and it almost, it's almost like you've got to have a good report card, and, and an obedient child is a good report card. Guys, do you understand? That's really not what's going on. What Paul is saying when he says that an elder should, should be, you know, this, his family should be this, and so forth, he's saying he should have already taken the land in the sphere of influence that God has given him before you give him more. Before you, before you send him on somewhere else. Don't do that. How many times have we laid hands on people in the church? And I'm talking about the church universal. How many times have we released people into ministry who their, the, their own allotment was still had the enemy entrenched in it? And we sent them out to go do something else. And their family is, meanwhile, is going to hell in a handbasket, and we got them out there ministering among the people. 
And what kind of a testimony is that? You know? What kind of a testimony is it? When somebody's in the pulpit or leading a Bible study or leading a ministry and, you know, his wife despises him and his children are running wild in the world and running after the enemy. What are we saying here? You know? It, just, it doesn't... It, it's, it's, it's dumb is what it is. It's really just flat out dumb. Because we've, we've allowed this person to leapfrog over their first ministry, their area where God has given them the land. And he said, here, now take the land. And he kind of looked at the land and said, well, it's full of Canaanites and they have iron chariots, so I'm going to go and minister over here. Oh, okay, you go minister over there. You know, Joshua said, no, take care of this area. This is what God gave you. Take care of this. And then expand your borders. Then once you, get, you start expanding, you can go as far as the borders. You know, just keep going from there. I love that. The question that you and I need to be answering is, have I possessed what God has already given me before I start clamoring for more? Because you know what? We've all been given a, a, an allotment. Maybe you can't see it on a map like this. But you've been given an area, and God has said to you, Here's your, here it is. This, is. this is your area. This is your ministry. This is, and it could be your family. I don't know. Whatever it is. Whatever God's given you, He's given you this area, this area of influence, your children, or whatever the case might be. And He's given it to you. He says, Now take the land. Get rid of the enemy. Uproot the enemy. Get them out of here. You can do it in the power and strength and, uh, and might of the Lord as you walk in faith and so forth. But don't, don't get discouraged because they have iron chariots and go minister somewhere else. Don't do that. That doesn't do anybody any favors. And it doesn't look good on your resume either, frankly. Joshua chapter 18, I want to quickly get through this. There's, you know... It says in verse 1, Then the whole congregation of the people of Israel assembled at Shiloh and set up the tent of meeting there. By the way, this is where the tabernacle remained until King David went and got the Ark of the Covenant and brought it back to Jerusalem after he had taken Jerusalem, made it the city of David, and then brought the tabernacle back there. Um, and, and later on, of course, it would be his son who would build the temple, Solomon. But... Uh, Shiloh remained the center of worship for about 300 years. And you know what's really cool about Shiloh? Right in the middle. It's right in the center of Israel. So basically what Joshua did is he took, he took the tabernacle, he took the Ark of the Covenant, and they moved. Remember where they were camped? They were camped at Gilgal. Do you remember that? And they picked up everything, and they went and they set it all up at Shiloh, and that's where they began to worship the Lord because it was in the center of Israel. What does that tell you? This is a great principle for victory for you and I who want to continue to walk in the victory of Jesus Christ. Keep the presence of God in the center of your life. Not on the peripheral. Not up there. Not down there. Not turned down. Not toned down. Right in the middle. Remain victorious that way. It says at the end of verse uh, 1 that the land lay subdued before them. We know it wasn't you know, perfectly cleared, but it was subdued. And it says, There remained among the people of Israel seven tribes whose inheritance had not yet been apportioned. So Joshua said to the people of Israel, How long are you going to keep putting this off here? Going up and taking possession of the land which the Lord your uh, God of your fathers has given you. So do you, you understand what's going on here, people? There are folks, they've gone out, they've done the battle. And then they came back to live at Gilgal. And then when Joshua said, okay, we're going to move to Shiloh. They said, okay, all right, we're going to go to Shiloh. And they go to Shiloh, and they pitch their tent there. And they're just living there. You know, it's like, wow. And seven tribes have not gone out to take their land. And Joshua says, what are you waiting for? Why are you sitting back? Why are you procrastinating? Go and get what God has given you. So he comes up with an idea to kind of move this thing along. 
He says, verse 4, provide three men from each tribe, and I'm going to send them out. And, and they're going to set out and go up and down the land, and they'll write down a description of it with a view to their inheritances, and, and then, then come back to me, and, and, and they, they shall divide it into seven portions for the remaining seven tribes. Judah shall continue in his territory on the south, and the house of Joseph shall continue in their territory on the north. And you shall describe the land in seven divisions and bring the descriptions here to me. And then we're going to cast lots for you here before the Lord our God. And the Levites, reminder, you know, have no portion among you. The priesthood of the Lord, that's their heritage. Gad and Reuben, half tribe of Manasseh, they're already on the other side of the Jordan. They've already received their inheritance. That's the part Moses gave them, remember? Verse 8, so the men arose and they went. And Joshua charged those who went to write the description of the land, saying, Go up and down in the land and write a description and return to me, and I'll cast lots for you here before the Lord in Shiloh. So the men went, passed up and down in the land, and wrote in a book a description of it by towns in seven divisions. Then they came to Joshua to the camp at Shiloh, and Joshua cast lots for them in Shiloh before the Lord, and there Joshua apportioned to the land, or excuse me, apportioned the land to the people of Israel, to each his portion, the lot of the tribe of the people of Benjamin, according to its clans, came up, and the territory allotted to it fell between the people of Judah and the people of Joseph. Notice that? Little tiny Benjamin. Remember, they always talked about Benjamin. I am the least of all the tribes of Israel. There they are, just kind of crammed in there between Ephraim and Judah and so forth. And, you know, it goes on in the next verses, 12 through the end of the chapter, all the way through the end of the chapter, and it just gives more of the specific uh, uh, descriptions of where those things land. Well, we've talked about several things here related to possessing the land, taking the land, why we hold back, how we need to get up and get busy, how we need to be careful not to become stagnant, static in our walk with the Lord. Are you pressing on? Are you pressing on? Do you do you do you? Do you feel like you're growing in your faith or do you feel like you're kind of just... Because really, very rarely do we kind of just plateau to become... At least I don't. I find that I either uh, increase or I decline. One of the two. And uh, declining is not good, by the way. And we need to keep pressing on. Taking what God has given us and possessing it. Taking it. Clearing it going for it. The teaching you've just watched contains notes and prayer points. The video play window contains a link for you to click on. It's circled in red. You will be redirected to the notes and prayer points archive.